This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. In offering to present my paper to this conference, I presumed that I would be presenting it to a small group of specialists in 17th century education, but I find myself addressing this very substantial gathering. I should also make it clear that I have no religious affiliation, so the conference can tick the box which says uh, all or none. <laughs> I've nevertheless been deeply touched by the atmosphere of this uh, commemorative event, and I'm very grateful for having been uh, included so warmly in the discussions I've had over these two days. Heartfelt thanks. My interest in Jesuit education arose from my study of the history of economic thought, in which uh, I'm a lecturer, and in particular on the life and works of William Petty, a 17th century English writer who's widely regarded as the pioneer of English political economy. He was also Oliver Cromwell's surveyor of Ireland, <laughs> in connection with the notorious plan to drive the Irish Catholic so-called rebels off their lands and redistribute these lands to Protestant English colonial settlers. Now, surprisingly, as it may seem, for someone sometimes regarded as the original ideologue of Protestant ascendancy in Ireland, Petty claims to have received an education while in his teens at a Jesuit college in France. And moreover, claims that this circumstance was crucial in launching him upon his career. Biographers and commentators on his life and works have accordingly claimed that this early Jesuit education influenced his mode of thinking, and I wanted to investigate this question further. In the process, I became fascinated with the role of Jesuit education in France at this time as a subject in its own right. The more so because, actually, as I began to study, it reminded me of uh, a time when I was a student back in the 1960s, and I spent a couple of months in a Jesuit, uh, uh, at a Jesuit church and school in Upper Egypt. And that's another story, that's my story. Uh, this is Petty's story. The particular college which Petty claims to have attended was the College of Le Mans in the town of Caen. This college had originally been a staging post for pilgrimage, pilgrims on the way to Mont Saint-Michel. It's the name, Le Mans. Over the years, however, it had developed an educational function of some kind, and in the 16th century, it was incorporated into the University of Caen as one of its colleges, and in turn, in the early 17th century, it was entrusted to the Jesuits. By the 1630s, when Petty claims to have studied there, it was regarded as one of the leading Jesuit colleges alongside Clermont in Paris and La Flèche. At this time, the Jesuits, for all their ups and downs in their relations with the French monarchy, were definitely up in this respect. The French monarchy had come to rely on the Jesuit education system for the provision of technical training for its state functions. As a consequence, French Jesuits were providing courses and publishing practical manuals on all kinds of professional skills, including military works on fortifications, artillery and so on, and on naval affairs. Besides engaging in nationwide debates on a variety of public affairs, the Jesuits of Le Mans also displayed a deep interest in local knowledge. One work, written in condemnation of superstitious practices, uh, current in Normandy at the time, preserves fascinating ethnographic information. While another, a massive work on naval affairs, includes a whole chapter on um, how to prevent sailors from swearing. Uh, not surprisingly, Jesuit education was proving attractive to students. It broke with the narrow scholarly education of the past and attracted students of much wider social strata than the previous scholastic education. Jesuits provided, them, uh, uh, provided young people with education in popular subjects, for example, uh, rhetoric, which in practice meant use of the Latin language, but uh, it began to be taught through texts on geography and history. The College of Le Mans was particularly large for colleges at the time, had over a thousand students. Betty said 2,000, but he was inclined to exaggerate, uh, when colleges usually had uh, a little more than 300 or so. 
Petty came from a family of clothiers in the town of Romsey in Hampshire, and they sent him to seek new, outline, uh, new outlets for their trade in France, apparently earning his keep by working his way on a ship back and forth across the town. In his reminiscences, written much later and very infuriatingly in Latin hexameter in appalling handwriting, but so far as one can make out, uh, he broke his leg somehow while on the coast of Normandy and was left there by his shipmates. After recovering, he made his way to the town of Caen where he met some Jesuit students bathing in the river there. Finding that he could speak some Latin, they persuaded him to apply to their college and in accordance with the procedure of the time, he wrote an application to the Jesuit fathers in the form of a poem in Latin hexameter. <laughs> He later, which I hope they could read, he later provided an English translation of this poem in which he illustrates uh, what attracted students to the Jesuit educational uh, system. He begins by relating how he'd become fed up with the narrow education he'd received in his hometown. In his English translation, he jazzes up the language a bit when he's talking about the corporal punishment he received, so I hope it gives the language. I, who a country boy, was put to school where I was born to a pedantic fool, and there formed verbs, did scan, construe, and parse, make verse and themes, but all to save my ear. Um, anyway, sort of <laughs> parse. He goes on to say how instead he wanted to study rhetoric and logic and above all geography and seafaring and become another Francis Drake. Very quick. His claim to have entered the college and studied there cannot be corroborated. We only have his own testimony. However, there's nothing fundamentally implausible in his claim. There were English students at Caen, and Protestants like Petty were also accepted into Jesuit colleges. Petty says that he received assurances that attempts would not be made to convert him away from his Protestant faith. He gives a description of the system of ed uh, education at Le Mans, which accords some considerable degree with uh, that in the Ratio Studiorum. He writes that there were twice five fathers, and that classes were subdivided, <coughs> and that these fathers would supervise their senior pupils, taking smaller pupils, what we call these days postgraduate uh, teaching uh, uh, assistants. Uh, and some of the language he uses, <coughs> uses uh, terms in early modern Latin that are also used in the uh, ratio in that connection. He gives a brief account of his curriculum, including all kinds of subjects, from rhetoric to history, philosophy, metaphysics, casuistics. Now, he jumbles these together in a manner that makes it difficult to identify just which year of the curriculum uh, he claims to have attended. Um, moreover, the facts of his biography suggest that his time at Le Mans cannot be cannot have been as much as two years, probably rather less. So his claims to have studied all the subjects he lists is not really credible. The uh, atmosphere of this college, intellectual atmosphere, must have been very exhilarating. The, the, the uh, identities of the twice five fathers of Le Mans at this time uh, do not appear to be listed anywhere, so far as I've been able to uh, find out. I hope maybe uh, somebody may help me with them. Um, more recent data sets and so on. There are lists from a little bit earlier and a little bit later. Earlier on, we can even find the name of the gardener, which would have been a uh, substantial position, actually, and in fact, the laundryman. But uh, frustratingly enough, the precise years when Petty claims to have been there, I've only been able to establish uh, one name, and that's the rector, Pierre Moukor, uh, of whom it's related. Um, was that one capital? No, there wasn't any capital. Oh, right. <laughs> it, uh, I'm inclined to talk too long, so I've arranged for the chair that he bangs on the microphone when he's going to wind up. So, of Monk wrote a number of uh, commentaries on uh, biblical texts, one of which he sold to an aristocrat who had it published under their own name with their own portrait uh, on the uh, frontispiece. That may not have been unprecedented. What was unprecedented was that that aristocrat was in fact a woman, and uh, that was an unprecedented act of uh, feminism at the time, which attracted uh, quite a, a, uh, a lot of attention. So, anyway, back to Petty. 
He claims that the education provided at Le Mans was at any rate in the teaching of languages better than any in England. In particular, he claims that it was there that he gained technical education from which he went on to gain a position in the English Navy. Uh, and um, he stated later in life, in fact, that the accident, I suppose his broken leg, he must have referred to, uh, which led him to attend the college was the origin of all his fame and riches. He details among his technical uh, training, uh, subjects classified at the time as practical mathematics, naval skills such as dialing, the movements of the stars, and also apparently the drawing of maps and uh, the drawing of maps was just being introduced at that time as a pedagogical device in the teaching of geography in Jesuit colleges. And uh, in that connection, uh, it's been noted that his map of Ireland, which was drawn up in uh, order to uh, uh, delineate the allocations of Irish lands to English settlers, was the first map of all Ireland. Finally then, actually, my main research question, before I got interested in all these things, uh, is there evidence of Jesuit influence on Petty's subsequent thought, particularly his political economy? Uh, well, um, probably not going to have much time to go into that in detail. There's some indication, as I've already hinted, that I think uh, he was seems to have been aware of some um, principles of Jesuit education, and his first published work was actually a proposal for an educational establishment, which um, shows that he had either directly or indirectly some uh, idea of the um, Geratio uh, Studiorum, though it was presented very much in a more uh, secular kind of uh, uh, presentation. So uh, I, I've actually come to rather negative conclusions as to the question of whether um, uh, Jesuit social and economic thought influenced Petty. I don't really think he became aware of the debates that were going on, despite the fact they were very intense and included some of the Jesuit fathers at uh, Caen. Um, my question was raised by the fact that the terminology of classical political economy is taken over very much from almsgiving doctrine and um, the question of what is necessary to a person and their believer in life to keep it and what is superfluous and they're supposed to give in alms. Uh, maybe there might be time to discuss that uh, uh, under um, questions. So despite having received rather negative conclusions on my main research subject, uh, the very investigation of this issue has illustrated, I believe, the vitality of the intellectual uh, life of that time and the rewards that can come from investigating possible channels of intellectual influence from unexpected directions. Well, I've, uh, I've learned so much about Jesuit education in these two days, but I think uh, what particularly comes over to me is the, uh, the variety of different positions taken by Jesuits at uh, different times in theology is probably reflected in social and economic uh, doctrine. At this time, they were working very closely with the French monarchy and uh, with the French uh, nobility and so on. So on the question of necessities, what you can keep, and superfluities, what you're uh, supposed to donate as arms, they um, 
very much fell in with the scholastic doctrine of Aquinas that necessities had to be defined in different ways for different people. For a poor man, obviously necessities are uh, uh, food and clothing and uh, basic housing. For a king, a uh, king's got to have a palace, so, you know, a different <laughs> level of necessities. And likewise for the rich. Now, the, uh, the Jesuits were working along with the social system now, along with the monarchy, and when they were uh, attacked very vigorously by uh, Pascal, for example, in Network Provincial, uh, they were attacked for defining necessities so widely that the rich didn't have to give any arms uh, at all. <coughs> so that was uh, the, the kind of um, debate which arose. It's interesting that some of the Jesuit fathers, whom, uh, uh, two of them in fact, whom uh, Pascal specifically named and the other um, Jansenists in Paris, were uh, at the University of Caen. And I would like so much to find out whether perhaps they were among Petty's teachers or not. They haven't managed to. Uh, Alan? Thank you for your fascinating talk. Um, there was a film on Cook in his travels, and they showed the map he did in New Zealand. And then they showed uh, his third journey to Newfoundland. They showed a space aerial uh, view of that same land, and they were identical. It's just amazing the perfection that's working. That might be interesting to me. Well, uh, William Petty's map of Ireland, again, was was uh, extraordinarily um, accurate, particularly since it was basically conducted as a military operation. It was soldiers of the army, basically, who uh, took over and uh, did it. It's very accurate. It very accurately reflects the map uh, as it is seen now, for example, in Ordnance Survey map, except in one respect. It's kind of 8 or 9% smaller. So if you superimpose his map on the map of Ireland as we now uh, know it, there's a little sort of fringe all around the edge uh, unaccounted for. Now, in the allotment of land, if you under-survey an area of land, you're actually over-allotting the area you're uh, allotting. So he was allotting the people um, for whom he was surveying the land about 8 or 9% more than they deserved. And he ended up very rich. You know. but, I mean, you can actually tell that must have been uh, what he sort of uh, received for his uh, uh, commission. Gentlemen over here. That's a lovely story of uh, this chap with broken leg coming across some Jesuit swimming, and they say, why don't you come to our school? I mean, it sounds extraordinarily welcoming and liberal, yeah. um, yes. and even a Protestant. Uh, yes. Would that have been typical? I th uh, well, I think so. School. You see, well, Petty said there were 2,000 students, so certainly over 1,000, and that was only one of the colleges of the university. These um, uh, colleges, particularly Jesuit colleges, were very open, and their theatrical performances and so on, uh, a lot of people would come to. I'm not sure what the population of Cornwall at the time would have been, but it was quite a small town. So the uh, presence of Jesuit students would have been very very uh, visible part of, of, uh, um, of town uh, life. That has kind of given me the thought that possibly Petty didn't really matriculate in anything, or maybe just did for a week or two, and was able to engage in it, and went to the odd um, uh, talk there, there, and so on. And, and then, because when he uh, tried to get into the Navy, he could sort of claim that he'd had a, a that occurs to me, but certainly the Jesuit presence, Jesuit students, they must have been there. Very evident. Perhaps broadening this into the, 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 under the heading of Jesuit education, I wonder if either Philip or you could answer the question. Uh, a large part of my Jesuit education, perhaps under the heading of pastoral care, certainly discipline, was the word ferula. <laughs> and, and I wanted to know if, if that played a part in. Um, the consistency of Jesuit, let's, let's put it up, under pastoral care of students. For those of you who don't know what the, the word ferula uh, means, uh, ask the panel. <laughs> uh, that's a question about corporal punishment in Jesuit schools, which in Britain sort of lasted, 
it was probably frequent until some point in the 1960s. The time I was going through school would have been dying out and would finally have been abolished in the 1980s. Um, I think it's something we need to think about and we have not done so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, no, not. No. <laughs> yeah, there's a dark side to some of the story that we need to think about. Yeah, I uh, if I could ask, uh, I'm really puzzled, and I'm sure you can help me. What did this gentleman have to gain in his position from boasting about Jesuit education? Wouldn't that have undermined his position? Uh, even if he was boasting about it, as you say, and he really didn't matriculate, that's even more difficult to contemplate. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, as I said, um, he may have uh, uh, claimed more of a technical education than he did to get the position position in the name that he got, about which, once again, we don't actually know anything. Um, but that is indeed... Um, uh, a question which has uh, worried me. One of the uh, chief sources is an interview that he had with his friend John Aubrey, which that is, uh, appears as one of Aubrey's famous uh, brief lives of his contemporaries. And in that, uh, Aubrey seems to be a bit embarrassed about the whole thing and um, expresses it in very roundabout ways. Uh, which is not surprising because it uh, the, that particular interview must have taken place about 1679, um, and uh, uh, some of this will depend on me getting hold of a decent neo-Latinist, actually. Uh, uh, William Petty also wrote a poem on Titus Oates, and I can't make a head or tail of it. Um, if anybody <coughs> wants to collaborate on a bit of that work, you can, uh, I can maybe answer that question. I think, given that hands are not moving, um, I would just like to finish by thanking Dr. Goodick very much indeed for telling us something important about being open to the stranger. Thank you. <laughs>